Okay, so we're going to open up these files. So just select them all. And if I hold the control key, I can say open with and choose the software that I want to open that up in. Um, I've already got Creative Cloud Photoshop launched, so I'm just going to stick with that. And it opens up those images. Now, all of these images, even though they appear black and white, they're all color. Unless you're very specific about the color space that you're using on your capture device, chances are it's going to capture it in RGB. One way of establishing that is if you look at your color palette, it's showing that it's RGB. Likewise, if you go to Image, Mode, it shows you that it's an RGB image. This doesn't need to be RGB. This is actually grayscale information. So I can convert this file to grayscale by going Image, Mode, Grayscale. And it asks me, do I want to discard the color information? And just watch what happens here in the environment. And discard, notice that the color palette changed to a grayscale or monotone color palette. The image pretty much looks the same as it did before. Now, I'm just going to save that. File, save as. Now, of course, the original data here was JPEG. A better option would have been to capture this either in raw data format or in TIFF, uncompressed TIFF. So let's pretend for a moment, uh, and we'll just simply capture this and save it as a TIFF. The problem with JPEG, well, the issue with JPEG is while it provides excellent compression of images and makes it very efficient to transmit them over the internet, it also takes great liberties with those images and will often destroy crucial image detail. It's part of the compression process. Uh, when you JPEG something, it actually reduces subtle variations of color and tone in the image. So we're going to choose TIFF with no compression. And I'm just spinning for us. So it saved that image as a TIFF. What I should have pointed out is that in saving the file, it's always good practice to use a file naming convention that clearly identifies content and to some degree ownership. So I always recommend all lowercase, last name, underscore, first name, underscore, name of the piece. And you'll notice that the software automatically appends the three-letter extension TIF to identify it. Now, let's take a look at another one. I can close this off now. I don't need to save that original one. I've already done so. And let's take a look at this. I have two issues with this. One, it has a blue cast to it. And two, it has a shadow cast or a vignette which is evident in the image. So I want to remove the color cast, and I also want to remove that shadow cast. First of all, let me change to grayscale. Image, mode, grayscale. Discard the color information. Almost immediately, I've lost that color cast. I still have this vignetting occurring, though. There is a preset 
in the filters menu that I can use, if I go to filter and I look at lens correction, you'll notice in the custom area, set for auto correction, in the custom area, I can correct for things like image or lens distortion or axis distortion of the camera relative to the artwork. If it was slightly tilted up or down or left to right, we could remove the parallax error and also error introduced by the curvature. Of the what I'm in area called vignette. And it gives you a midpoint and the amount of vignette reduction. So you'll notice if I crank it one way, it starts to darken that image. So it's using a radial mask or filter to apply lightness or darkness. And that filter may well eliminate the issue altogether. Be mindful of not pushing it too far because if you do so, you'll notice that the corners appear much brighter than the rest of the image. You want a balanced view of the entire image. Sometimes that's difficult to do. And the midpoint is really determining where the 50-50 point is from 0% to 100% black in the mask. The distribution of that effect from the very outside to the center of the image. And without knowing the technical details of it, you can simply play with these sliders, watch the image for feedback, and when you've got a satisfactory amount of reduction, oh, I'm sorry, I moved the wrong thing. Um, When you're satisfied with the results, you can just confirm that. So that's an automated procedure. Let's take a look at how you would do that manually. So I'm just going to cancel out of this. And I'm going to do the same thing, only in this instance, I'm going to use adjustment layers. So if I go to Layer, To go to layer, new adjustment layer, and I'm going to choose a very simple exposure adjustment. Click OK. It creates two things. If you look in the layers palette, you'll notice here it has created an icon for an exposure adjustment. That's what that plus minus relates to. It also created this square to the right of it. That square represents a mask. Now, currently, there is no mask. It's completely open, meaning any change here that I make to exposure settings, so you notice if I click on the mask, it has the mask up here under Properties, selected. If I click on the plus minus icon, it switches over to the Properties for the Exposure Adjustment. So let's take a look at what happens if I change the Exposure setting. I can make the entire image darker, or I can make the entire image much lighter. It's always good to go to the extremes to see what these effects are doing when applied. So I'm increasing the exposure to the point where I'm eliminating the shadows in the top left and bottom left. I can also correct midtones here as well. That's what this slider will help adjust. So I can thicken up the interpretation of the line work, or 
thin it out, make it a little more subtle, and establish more levels of gray. So again, it's an interpretive process where you're using the screen for feedback. I'm just going to boost the exposure. Now, I've clearly overexposed this image. However, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to select the map. And you'll notice that it has four corners that are highlighted. Now that I've got that mask selected, I'm going to fill the mask, edit, fill, and I'm going to fill the mask with black. Notice that the effect has been removed. Here's the effect and here's the mask. It's blocking out the effect from being passed on to the image below. So what I want to do in this case is paint out the areas on the mask where I want the exposure setting to take effect. And to do that, I need to change my color slider, my grayscale slider, so that I'm painting in white. Notice I'm set to white. K, by the way, stands for black. I can then choose my brush. If I move there, I can see the size of my brush and I can use the right and left brackets to variously increase and decrease the size of my brush respectively. I'm going to use a fairly large brush and I'm also going to ensure that the hardness of that brush is set to zero. That gives a nice soft gradual edge to your brush. I could also change applying the white at 50% or thereabouts. So I'm going to label, and you'll notice a very gradual layer of paint on my mask. Yes. It's not even effect. I'm glad you asked that. So the question was, any editing, will it be affecting the image or all around the image? It's actually what we call non-destructive editing. So it's not actually affecting the original image pixels at all. This effect that we're applying remains autonomous from the actual image. In fact, if I switch it off, it takes us back to the original image with no effects. So it's a non-destructive form of editing. And I can variously go through this and make the appropriate adjustments. Again, at any point, I can change the opacity. Now, I may well have gone too far in this instance, and that's fine too, because I can paint that mask back in. Let me just show you the mask. So if I go to the Channels palette, and I can bring that mask in, there it is. Where you're seeing the red, I'm preventing the exposure from um, the exposure effect. Where you see no red, the exposure effect is being felt or applied to the image. I'm just going to switch the image off. That's the mask. So let me just paint back on that mask. And this time, instead of painting in white, let me paint in black. I'll just set the opacity to 100%. Paint 
paint directly on here. And I could even go so far as to apply a blur. Filter, blur, I'm going to use a Gaussian blur here. And I'll just zoom out so I can see the effects of that blurring. I blur it a bit more. There. Very, very subtle application of differentiated exposure. Out here on the edges, we'll be increasing center near the drawing. We'll be keeping it pretty much normal. There you can see that red area. I'm just going to switch that off. And you can see that we've significantly improved the quality of the image. If I go back to my layers palette, I'm going to switch off the correction and then switch it back on. And even if I feel like I've done too much, I can always reduce the amount of that exposure. I can click on the exposure setting and make an adjustment and just drop it back again. And so, in this fashion, you have a tremendous amount of regional control over how that image looks. This will be significant if you are putting an image together out of multiple scans. Because things that are too, mu uh, too large for the scanning bed typically have areas around the edge where the light leaks out and causes very dark bands. And so where you're trying to stitch those areas together, a technique like this could help match up the gray values between the two sections of an image that you're trying to stitch together. So that's the use of the vignette filter and also so we use the uh, filter then we went to sorry we went to filter and then from there we went to Lens Correction, Custom, and used, within Custom, we used the Vignette Filter. And as a... We used Custom Filtering using Layer adjustment layers. In this case, we used an exposure adjustment. So that's preparing your images, getting them to look the best they can. Next, we're going to bring these images into InDesign and take a look at how to create a layout for your portfolio.